right, so first of all, I should of course declare that I have no conflicts of interest in this because critical thinking is universal and should always be applied no matter what context. Examples of false advertising and products that do not work as claimed or intended are numerous and we are exposed to these advertisements virtually on a daily basis and you of course recognize all these features. Homeopathy with the example here, human chorionic gonadotropin uh, that for some reason was thought to reduce appetite and body weight and became popular in the US for many years. I, I used to show this particular picture to my medical students and ask them what kind of compound is the human chorionic gonadotropin which is used for pregnancy tests. And um, occasionally someone will remember that this is a protein. And of course, if this is taken orally, there's no chance whatsoever that it will reach the target in a functional state. So this can be immediately dismissed with a tiny little bit of chemical knowledge. Then we have acupuncture, targeting meridians and acupoints that do not exist. But I will not talk further about that. That could be a lecture in itself. And some people believe in crystals, others believe in magnets, like this wonderful blanket which contains magnets. And you can treat your dog with this for less than 1,000 euros, a bargain. And bioresonance is another phenomenon that doesn't exist. But as I already indicated with my first example, my interest in appetite regulation and body weight regulation is quite strong because I've been doing research for many, many years on the brain's most powerful stimulant of feeding and appetite. That's a neuropeptide. So I always read advertisements for losing body weight with great interest. And this is one such fantastic remedy. You put these patches onto your skin near your belly button, your navel, and the lipids, the fat will go away. It will just melt and be sucked out into this piece, of this little patch. And um, see what wonders it can make. Um, not only does the fat go away, it also shrinks your skin, so it will adapt to your new slim figure, and it gives you a tan. Uh, I think they have mixed up these fixtures in a lifespan perspective. It's usually the other way around. These are still being sold. Amazon is marketing these, and there are several different varieties. Uh, the one common denominator for all of them is that they fool the customer. Here is an example from Sweden that was launched internationally. It's a product called Antinitus, uh, marketed by a company that existed under the name Acloma. And tinnitus, tinnitus, as many of you know, is this irritating ringing sound that can linger because it's produced inside our inner ear. Um, the interesting thing with this uh, advertisement was that it explained how these magical patches, uh, how they really work when you put them behind your ear. Here is the explanation. Um, this patch contains a unique raster, a patented lens that creates an organized signal, which is anticipated, note the word anticipated, it's not shown to do this, it's anticipated, to modulate nerve functions in the auditory system through light wave treatment. It contains a unique raster that creates a regular organized fractal light, and so on and so forth. This is plain bullshit. This has no explanatory power whatsoever. This is written to seduce an unknowing customer that doesn't know the meaning of these words. This is betrayal. And this was fortunately noticed by the Swedish Medical Products Agency. So they performed an investigation and concluded already after three years <laughs> that they should ban this product. But the company appealed and asked for a deeper investigation, and thereby they could sell this product for another 18 months. Um, but eventually the court in my hometown, Uppsala, where the Swedish 
Medicinal Products Agency is located came to the same conclusion as uh, the agency and this product was banned. But there were no fines to collect because miraculously the company had already gone into bankruptcy during this period. I think it was all planned. This is not the only example like that. There are several. But I believe that one of the worst scams of all is homeopathy. And uh, you all know very well. And what I try to inform my students and the general public whenever I get the opportunity is to explain why it doesn't work. And uh, when people hear that this was invented or conceived in the late 1700s by one single person, they begin to think more critically, I believe. And the two principles, as you all know, is that like yours like, and Hahnemann was not satisfied with that. He also felt that when he diluted the original compound that he tested on himself, he thought that the effect was getting stronger. Now, when he wrote about this in the first edition of his book, Rationell und Heilkunde, in 1810, he might have been excused, because it wasn't until the year after, 1811, that Amadeo Avogadro presented his theoretical calculations that matter consists of a limited number of particles. One cannot dilute forever, because eventually one will run out of particles. Um, now, it took a few decades to prove this scientifically with chemical experiments. And, and what fooled scientists for those decades was that the gases they were investigating, like oxygen and nitrogen, are actually molecules consisting of two atoms of the elements. But once that was realized, everything fell into place, and it was crystal clear that um, the dilutions work as predicted from science, not from homeopathy. So the mystery is, why has this lingered in our societies for so long and keeps fooling patients? And um, when we compare this with the dramatic progress that has been made in the sciences, pharmacology, which is my field that builds on biology, and biology is perfectly consistent with chemistry, and chemistry follows the rules of physics. Everything is consistent in a contiguous fashion. There are no contradictions between these sciences, which means that we can make predictions, test if they are true, and if necessary, adjust the details of the hypotheses. Whereas in homeopathy, in contrast, if someone would be able to show that homeopathy works, that person could be nominated for no less than three Nobel Prizes. The Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, of course, that we will hear about on Monday, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, of course, as well as the Nobel Prize in Physics. And when you think of it, if we could produce drugs just by diluting the compound, we could easily supply the needs for the entire world. It would be so cheap to produce medical products. So that would uh, entitle you to uh, uh, the Swedish National Bank Prize in Economic Science to the memory of Alfred Nobel. And with much better health care, there would be much more peace on earth and you would get the peace prize as well. <laughs> so then all you need to do is write a book about it and you will get the literature prize as well. No, I, I'm saying this also, uh, I tell my students, to point out that it's so easy to ridicule preposterous ideas like homeopathy. But when one speaks to a believing homeopath, of course, one cannot do that. One has to be very careful, because what we want to achieve is to make people think. Think carefully about what evidence there is. One of the founders of the Swedish Skeptics Association, my colleague Sven Uwe Hansson, who is a professor emeritus of philosophy at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, he for some reason got hold of a package of a homeopathic product and he read the ingredients on the label and saw that it listed something that had been diluted away. So he then wrote this article in uh, the Journal of Internal Medicine and pointed out that there is no ethically acceptable reason to exclude homeopathic products from correct information to the customers. 
But in fact, this package was lying to the customer, saying that there is something in the bottle which has been diluted away. It is as if we would allow orange juice to be diluted 10 to the 30 times and still be sold in a supermarket under the name of orange juice. But our legislation wouldn't allow that. There, there would be a consumer uproar. They would boycott this supermarket. But if it is something aimed to cure disease, it's not only allowed to sell it, it's even allowed to call it a medicinal product. Isn't that weird? There are many reasons to doubt homeopathy. Nothing has really happened since it was proposed in the 1790s. There is no well-designed study that has been replicated. There are a few, of course, by chance there will be a few that show an effect, but none of those has been replicated. None of those with a strict protocol. Uh, companies, excuse the misprint, companies that make the homeopathic products do not perform any research worth that name. Um, one can have strong uh, critique against some of the big pharma companies, but on average they reinvest somewhere around 17% of the revenues in research. I found the number for uh, the largest manufacturer in the world of homeopathic products, Boiron, in France. Maybe they are no longer the largest, but they were at that time. They reinvest 0.25% in the research, and that is not top-notch research. So, obviously, they do not even believe in it themselves, because if they did, they would do research to be nominated to the Nobel Prize. And um, the memory mechanisms that have been proposed for the water pattern um, will not last very long. That imprint in the water will go away after a few femtoseconds. That is a very short time to use a compound. And if the homeopaths claim that this water pattern would persist in the water, how can they remove it? Won't the water remember every little molecule that it encountered on its path to the present? These are the things that we noted and pointed out in this organization, the European Academy's Science Advisory Council. And um, after careful investigation, we issued this statement about homeopathic products. And we ended with the following pieces of advice. These should not be designated medicinal products. Public health care should not reimburse something that obviously doesn't work and cannot work. The packages must have a clear and fair description of the contents. In other words, they must follow the general marketing rules. There must be no exception for this deceptive product. So what can we do about this? Well, there are several important ways to try to deal with this. One is debunking. One is pre-bunking, that is to make people prepared for deception so that they will think critically from the very beginning. Uh, another way to describe that is to inoculate people with critical thinking. And of course, education is an important part of that. And this applies both to the general public and to healthcare professionals that may also be deceived by the marketing and the way the legislation has been phrased. We need better consumer-protecting legislation, and we need to enforce that legislation to make sure that it serves the purpose. As an example of debunking, I think the ESAC statement is a very good example, and uh, we are very grateful to Jos van der Meer, who was uh, the president of ESAC at the time, when this working group phrased this statement. So I was delighted to see that he received this award for his important, crucial role in this work. Another person I would like to mention who has done a fantastic job to debunk is another 
recipient of an award, Eleja Delsink, whom I had the pleasure to correspond with when he prepared his investigation. And uh, he has classic autism, and he is open about that, which uh, is admirable by itself. And he also exposed uh, the, the fooling companies that were selling a homeopathic vaccine, claiming that they could cure autism in that way. And I believe eventually the, the, the authorities realized that this had to be stopped. Now, debunking isn't always easy, and therefore we have this debunking handbook that I presume most of you are aware of. And uh, since a few years, this uh, revised version is also available in Dutch and in many other languages. And this is where we can um, tell people how to handle these situations. So everyone does that in the best possible way, because as I said, it's not easy to get the message across and one has to be prepared for discussions and have the arguments ready. Um, fortunately, to our help, we have a couple of booklets by John Cook and Steve Lewandowski. Here is another one, the COVID-19 communication handbook about how to explain how vaccines work, and also the conspiracy theory handbook by the same authors which is also available in Dutch and several other languages. Now, pre-banking, uh, as defined in Wikipedia, is uh, the process of debunking lies and the tactics or sources even before they happen, before they hit people. And to do that, we need to present the scientific facts to people, describe the scientific methods, describe the source checking procedures and how essential they are, and also point out that some resources are not as reliable as one would wish, but there are some that are usually quite trustworthy in the scientific literature. So information and education are the key components of this. Now, uh, as you know, there are not very many uh, textbooks that describe alternative medicine in a critical way uh, to start from evidence-based medicine. But there are a few that I would like to recommend, as I do to my medical students. And this is a wonderful book more than 15 years ago, Trick or Treatment, by Edzard Ernst, the, wor the world's first professor in complementary medicine. And I'm sure most of you know very well about his achievements. Is he performed careful studies of alternative medicine and concluded that most of them do not work beyond placebo. Here's another book of his together with the last speaker today, Kevin Smith, also an excellent compilation with concrete examples how um, mischievous advertisements are spread in media. And Edzard has also written this compilation. It's like an encyclopedia about alternative medicine that describes in a critical way uh, what works and what doesn't work. And as you anticipate, most of the things do not work beyond placebo. Um, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has also contributed Still, our texts are only available in Swedish. I initiated this uh, series of texts when I was the president, or well, already before I was the president of the academy, and things became urgent when the pandemic of COVID-19 hit the world, so we prioritized releasing this about vaccine. Now, these texts are all freely downloadable from the academy website, uh, so they can be uh, disseminated. And I hope also they can be translated to other languages. The groundwork has already been done, so all we need is translation for those who are willing to do that. And uh, the committee that wrote this text consists of world-leading experts on vaccine development and infectious diseases. Uh, this text is uh, about a dozen pages, maybe a little bit too difficult for people who are not native Swedish speaking. So we then made a, a simpler version and shorter version, a summary about vaccine production, which also explained how the COVID vaccines could be developed so quickly and still be properly uh, supervised by uh, uh, registering 
agencies that approve drugs. And we have made a whole series of texts also on other to topics like climate change, GMOs, evolution and biodiversity, human evolution, which is apparently controversial in some parts of our societies, and the most recent one is about artificial intelligence. Um, so, uh, let me then spend the last few minutes on how to go about this. We have the debunking and the pre-banking, as we already said, but we have two more aspects, the consumer protection from legislation and to enforce that. And the question is how we are doing with that. And I think there is a lot that remains to be done there. Um, uh, the good news, though, is that at least in Sweden, after some investigations, I find that the, the major agencies that should take responsibility actually communicate with one another. Uh, the consumer uh, agency has regular contacts with the Swedish Medical Products Agency as well as the National Food Agency, and they try to work proactively but of course they do not have enough resources to, to cover everything. But they follow social media to pick things up before it gets too bad. Um, they also point out that the consumer protection laws are actually more general than the medical products laws, uh, which can sometimes be used to stop these borderline products that are marketed. Um, also, there is a website called the Swedish Healthcare Guide, which is quite extensive and is continuously expanding and is often the first source that people go to for information. And uh, to my great pleasure, in the next few days, they will launch also information pages about alternative medicine, where they describe what alternative medicine is and what it isn't. Uh, they don't call it alternative medicine, they call it alternative therapies or alternative treatments, not to mix it with medicine. So I think this will be a very objective and fair description of the situation. And it's carefully phrased not to put off those who are proponents of this, because we want them to keep reading. And also what they point out here is the poor consumer protection which means that one has to be very careful. And patients are encouraged to tell their doctors what methods they are using, because as you know, some of them can interfere with evidence-based medical pharmacological treatments by causing more rapid degradation, for instance, of medicines. But it's clear that we can have more of this collaboration, especially at an international level. Uh, the European Medical Products Agency or Medicines Agency uh, have laws that include homeopathic products as medical products, which is quite amazing. And it must be extremely frustrating for those extremely skilled experts to be bound, restricted by those ridiculous laws in the European Union. The European Food Safety Authority is also involved because, as you know, many foods are sold with medical claims. And what is uh, allowed by EFSA today is to say that this component contributes to the normal function of the immune system, for instance. But this is a completely empty statement. You could say that about water. It contributes to the normal function of the immune system. So it's beyond me how they could allow something like that. So this is clearly something that needs to be looked at further. Uh, and these international organizations, including the one in the United States, the FDA, need to interact with the local agencies in the different countries. The WHO does a fantastic job in some regards, but they are also at least indirect proponents of traditional medicine without any clear explanation why. So obviously they need to be sharper in the distinction between evidence-based medicine and traditional medicine. And we need to 
achieve better compliance with the laws that exist. And maybe some laws need to be sharpened so that this false advertising cannot go on and on and on. And of course, the big challenge is that this happens now internationally on websites. The, the world is the market for many companies. So we need more collaboration internationally. And I would like to end with uh, this important quote from a former colleague in Belgium, Willem Betz, who said, you can't legislate against stupidity. You can't legislate for stupidity. And that's what the European Union has done with homeopathy. So I'd like to add, we can legislate for consumer protection so that we hold those companies responsible for their claims. So, to summarize, there is a lot of progress. We have made progress in our ways to inform, educate, debunk and pre-bunk. But it's a tough race. Disinformation and misinformation is spreading rapidly in social media as well as in established media. So journalists need to become better at fact-checking. Some are superb. Those are the ones we give the awards from the skeptic associations. But I dare say that some general journalists may not be sufficiently familiar with the scientific literature, so they cannot distinguish the quality of different journals, and they need to be informed about that. Commercial media need to be more concerned about ethics of publishing these advertisements. Scientists need to become more engaged in these discussions. And the federal agencies and the judicial institutions need to take responsibility. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I will look forward to discussion with you in the breaks today. Uh, and I have added to my license plate on my car this little line, always look on the bright side of life because the good thing about alternative medicine is that it makes people think critically in the best of these worlds. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. And uh, one of the viewers online uh, has a question which I think you partially answered in your last uh, slide. He says, uh, social media strongly promulgate, uh, propagate misinformation. Uh, the social media algorithms promote quackery and anti-vax propaganda. Do you see this as a problem? And how can we do something about that? Should the social media be allowed to promote misinformation? This is really the most important question, because it is a tough arms race. Uh, the social media offer opportunities to spread science, scientific methods, but we also have this problem. And of course, the balancing act here is the freedom of expression. People must be allowed to express opinions, but we must restrict when this goes awry and ends up in harassment. And there are many scientists who have been harassed just because they tell what the science has found. And this is something that the university should offer. Universities should offer better protection for these scientists. We had some really horrible examples during the COVID-19 pandemic when scientists were harassed and even strongly criticized by other scientists in a non-scientific way. So better support from society and maybe also some of the legislation uh, regarding harassment and, and libel should be reconsidered. But it is a difficult question. Yeah. Are there any more uh, urgent questions? Uh, Professor Van der Meer, can you come in front? Because uh, Catherine is taking the microphone, but <laughs> I know you run faster. <laughs> and I would have given you the floor anyway, because you were... No, no, no. Uh, okay. Um, Dan, thank you for a, for a great talk. Um, one of the things you didn't mention is how often should we repeat a message? And uh, so what I mean is when we were writing the ESEC statement uh, report on, uh, against homeopathy, 
we had quite, a, quite an effect in some countries, and in some countries were just deaf for the message. Uh, but even in the countries that responded with changing, for instance, the curriculum, putting out homeopathy from the medical curriculum, um, they tend to return to a kind of steady state of, of, of nonsense again. So what would be your advice in terms of repeating messages like an ESAC report? Should there be a, an update? Should we bombard the European Committee again? And so on and so on. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, as you point out, uh, these messages are often forgotten and sometimes deliberately forgotten. So I think what uh, we could do is to take every opportunity to relaunch uh, these statements like the one from Isaac. So when there is a piece of news about homeopathy, uh, and there are many good pieces of news. It's been restricted in the UK, in France. There was a message this morning from Spain that uh, homeopathy will be restricted even further. The sad news, although things have been going in the right direction in France, is that they now have a Minister of Education and Research which has some really doubtful remarks in, in the past. So whenever we hear this news, we should link to the report and say, here are the basic facts about homeopathy. Please pay attention to these. So repetition is the mother of learning and knowledge. One last question was a young lady there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I wanted to share with you that you mentioned the EMA, uh, for instance, and uh, I have the experience that when I call the inspection, the our national uh, guard inspection uh, about uh, transcorneal electric stimulation. Uh, which should cure uh, incurable retinal diseases. Uh, they say, well, EMA has uh, approved it, so then we are finished. Instead of, uh, so that's, that's a problem. Exactly, and that's not the only agency that are cla is claimed by proponents to have approved methods. We have the same situation with acupuncture in, in Sweden. Um, but what is important for these agencies is to say that uh, recommendations adjust to the level of knowledge. So if the evidence changes, the recommendations for use also change. So nothing is carved in stone. Um, that's the strength of science, that we adjust recommendations based on that. And, and certainly some methods are abused, although they may work to some extent in some situations, then some people jump on the bandwagon and try to cure everything with them. Like now infrared light, which is claimed to be good for almost everything. Laser is also abused, and so on and so forth. Magnetic stimulation of different kinds. So it is difficult to find the situations where it really works versus those where there is no evidence yet. Done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh,